All right. All right, let's go ahead and get started tonight. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Monday, February 24th, Walton City Council meeting. Tonight, we'll start off with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Morrison. I thought he was waiting for a musical. Like, <laughs> I was like looking for the band. <laughs> All right. So announcements. We have a new employee. So a new employee introduction for Mary Daly, a new account technician in utility billing. Come on up. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor. Counselors, um, I'm Matt Warner. I'm the Assistant Finance Director for City of Walton. Mm -hmm. I'm here tonight to introduce Mary Daly. She's our new accounting technician in the Finance Department. Um, her first day with us was February 10th, and she's got oh, wow. two weeks under her belt, and she keeps coming back, so we're All excited right. about that. <laughs> um, Mary will primarily be responsible for the business license programs and rental licenses. Um, she'll be preparing bank deposits, maintaining our vendor files, uh, sending out and following up on miscellaneous billings and evaluating and streamlining our procurement process. Additionally, you may see her at the front counter um, providing coverage for answering phones, processing passports, and receiving utility payments. She comes to us from sunny San Luis Obispo. Wow. <laughs> um, she made the move up north to be closer to her two boys and four grandchildren. Oh. She brings with her over <laughs> 11 years of experience doing the same types of work. Uh, she holds a liberal studies degree from CSU Cal Poly and is a licensed real estate agent. Outside of work, her hobbies include wine tasting, going to concerts, cooking, <laughs> and keeping up with the latest crime doc documentary on Netflix. Uh -oh. <laughs> Mary is an excellent addition to the city of Tualatin, and we're so happy to have her on our team. Thank you. Welcome. So I heard you hear about Tualatin down in California. Um, well, my boys moved okay. up here. And I just kind of followed them because, you know, grandma. The grandkids, yeah. My mother did the same thing. <laughs> Got to do it. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you're joining a terrific team. Um, the city uh, is well known for its terrific services and the folks who work for the city. Um, we hear rave reviews from the residents, how well they're treated and how quickly their issues are resolved. So if you're going to be a public face and, the, you know, the voice on the phone, um, you'll be talking to obviously a lot of residents and if you're collecting fees for business permits, you'll be meeting a lot of new business owners mm -hmm. and I welcome you to the city of Tualatin. Thank you very much. Are you, are you living here in town or I'm outside? I'm in Sherwood. Sherwood, close mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then anybody have anything else? Welcome. Come on up. And Thanks. <laughs> That, bring us, that brings us to the consent agenda. Those items in our consent, consent agenda are considered routine and will be adopted. What? Did I skip something? Public comment. Public comment. Yeah. I'm sorry. It shot right past. I told you my machine's freaking out because it wants to do a Windows update. Sorry about that. I'm fighting it to not do it. All right. So public comment. Uh, citizen comments is an opportunity to address the council on anything that is, on, that is not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments for about three minutes. If there's anyone here who would like to address the council, this is a good time. I have sign-ups, but you don't have to be signed up uh, to address the council, but I do take the sign-ups first. And our first person on the list is Grace Lucini. Good evening. Welcome, Grace. Hi. Thank you. I, my name is Grace Lucini. My home and my property are within the Basalt Creek area. My address is included on my comment slip. I'm here with my husband, John Lucini. I am providing this comment as a supplement to the number of emails and comments and concerns that I have sent to the city and to the city council. 
In three minutes, I couldn't possibly go cover all of the issues contained within those emails. I received an email today from the city attorney on this issue, which I really appreciate. I just apparently just got another one, which I haven't had a chance to re <laughs> re review yet. Uh, the key issue is our concerns that the city is not being transparent about what is or is not being proposed for the Salt Creek area, the area uh, southwest Boone's Ferry Road. Uh, for an example, we were told by the city personnel previously that there had been some recent negotiations uh, relating to a transfer of services agreement with Washington County that related to the southwest Boone's Ferry Road in the Basalt Creek area. However, today we were told that there are no documents that relate to or any such agreement. At the same time, we cannot tell whether a part of the property that we own and live on, located west side of uh, west, uh, southwest Boone's Ferry Road, is currently being proposed over our objections for involuntary annexation into the city or not. My husband and I ask three simple things of this council at this time. That the council instructs staff to provide us any further documents that relate to any agreement in the, in, with the, uh, the county about this area, the uh, southwest Boone's Ferry Road in the Basalt Creek area. Two, that you instruct the staff to meet with us to go over any documents that have been provided to us and to address and explain what is actually being proposed or not being proposed or negotiated by the city that covers any part of the west side of west, uh, southwest Boone's Ferry Road. And three, that you keep in mind that the city has represented to the public that annexation into Tualatin is voluntary, as it should be. Um, please instruct the staff to make sure that that promise is kept. There should be no proposals that are presented to you that involve involuntary annexation of the west side of Southwest Boone's Ferry Road. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And the latest I saw, I saw a couple of emails going back and forth between yourself, Aquila, and Mr. Brady with some clarifications and the willingness to meet. Uh, so I, I believe Akula has already uh, reached out and, and offered to meet. Uh, I have as well to, to join in that meeting. And then there, as far as uh, uh, documents, uh, we provided the urban planning area agreement with uh, us in Washington County, as well as the consent to the annexation of the right-of-way that Washington County provided. Uh, there were two documents related to that and then the urban planning area agreement. All right. All right. <clears throat> Uh, item second person signed signed up by CI officer Kelly Kurth. <laughs> Welcome. Again, yes, I'm Kelly Kurth, and I'm one of the CIO Byram officers, mostly involved with land use. And I'm in here in regards to coming back from an October meeting when all of you had these on, and you proclaimed that Talton was a B city. And at this time, um, you made out some nice communication to the city back in September. And now we're in that part of the season that the world of pollinators are about ready to travel through this community. So I'm here in a sense to mention that it would be very helpful and highly recommended that you could get a nice reposting of what this means to our city about the land of Tualatin being more friendly to the traveler pollinators that come through our community. Um, through the resolution that you put out in, in October, um, there are many areas in here that um, I wanted to give a little bit of extra information to you. I do know that your parks and rec people are gonna be your core to put this into place. Um, but I wanted to, because I live in Byram area by the high school and by the elementary, which has a huge garden in the making. I don't know if any of you have recently seen Byram's pollinator. They even have a pollinator garden. Plus, um, there's a huge habitat area around the high school, and there's so many connections with the youth there that I would really like to encourage some more reaching out to them so that some of these high school students who have interest in sustainability, environmental areas, could work with your parks and recs department. But that communication link is not real clear yet and how the public or students can be involved to help this become more implemented in the community. So that's why I'm here to just put out a little plug to think about how to re-bring the public awareness. And before everyone goes out and buys maybe things they shouldn't buy and start spraying all over the place, 
it would be so nice to have some incentive to the public of look at your alternative ways, look at metro suggestions, look at ways that you can deal with things in your yard that don't mean chemical treatments. So there's just so much education things that could be done. So I want to leave with you before I leave my little three minutes here. Um, Oregon State University has already published so much and here is a list of the top 25 plants that will bloom from spring till fall for all pollinators. And here's a pamphlet of all the native bees that are from the Portland area. And there is an Oregon uh, bee project already by Oregon State University in place for the entire state with incredible resources for cities. So if you haven't heard of all those things, I wanted you to know that they're there. They're in place. So I will give you all this and I hope to come back another time. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> now we're up to consent agenda. <laughs> All right. Uh, consent agenda are things that are considered routine, will be adopted by one motion unless someone council would like one of them removed and heard separately later tonight. Tonight, the consent agenda cons uh, comprises item one consideration of approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of January 27th, 2020, and work session and regular minutes of February 10th, 2020. And item number two consideration of approval of liquor license renewals. For 2010. Does anyone want anything removed consent? Item two, please. Okay, we're going to remove item number two consideration of approval of liquor license renewals for 2020 from the consent agenda. And we'll talk about that later. Motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve <clears throat> the consent agenda as amended. Any discussion on the motions? All in favor say aye. 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 Those who oppose, it's unanimous. All right. Moving on to special reports. Item number one, our quarterly financial report from Mr. Hudson. <laughs> Step up work here. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Don Hudson. I'm the Assistant City Manager here at the City. And I have with me this evening for the first part of our presentation, Tanya Moffitt, partner with Marine & Company, who is our annual auditors. Uh, tonight, I will be talking about our audit results, or I'll turn it over to Tanya to do that. I'll give you some information on our, for the first six months of our fiscal year, our budget to actual. I'll talk about our quarterly in investment report, and then talk a little bit, give you an update of where we're at with the 2021 budget process. So you have in front of you the uh, comprehensive annual financial report for the city as well as the financial statements for the Twalton Development Commission. I said I'm going to turn it over to Tanya to kind of talk about the audit process, how wonderful we are, and how wonderful our numbers are. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Honorable Mayor and City Council members, I'm here um, to present the June 30, 2019 financial statements for the City of Tualatin and the Tualatin Development Commission. Um, one thing I would like to point out is that the City's financial statement is what's considered a comprehensive annual financial report. This is actually an awards program. So the City has went above and beyond what the requirements are for municipal financial statements, uh, um, the requirements from the state and the requirements from the Government Accounting Standards Board. They have included additional things in the financial statements, which include the transmittal letter, the statistical section, which has 10 years worth of historical data, and some additional information. It's an awards program that goes through and looks at the financial data to make sure that it's um, presented in a really readable way for the public and for the citizens and for you as well. Um, so I'd like to point out that the city received the comprehensive annual financial report award for the June 30, 2018 financial statements, and we anticipate that the city will also receive that for the June 30, 2019, because you basically get it like a year later. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because it's something that the city management and the finance department has taken a lot of time and effort to put in this additional information for you and for the citizens. So I just want to point that out because that's it takes a lot of time. Um, 
our opinion on both financial statements is an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level of a financial statement opinion that we can give on a financial statement. Um, when we came out and did the audit, we had full access to anything that we needed. Uh, we also do look at a few things that are not financial related. So for example, the Oregon State Legislature has some very specific things that they want Oregon Municipal Auditors to look at. So a good example is ORS 279, which is public purchasing requirements. So one of the things that we do is we look to ensure that the city is doing the appropriate things when you're going out and doing bidding processes, that it's being posted appropriately on the paper, that everybody has an opportunity to bid on those projects, and that either the lowest bidder or the most qualified bidder is the one that's selected. So we look at that process as well. So there are some things in our financial report that are not necessarily financial related. We only had one item that we noted in that compliance report, and that was the police department went over budget a little bit in one of um, in that line item. Uh, my understanding is that that has a, a lot to do with the police contracts and the fact that the city buys back or pays out um, some of the uh, the holiday holiday, holiday pay. pay. It's a timing issue, but by the time we realized that was happening, we couldn't come to you for an, a budget adjustment. Because you have to do it prior to the end of the year, and that happens in June, so it's a little bit hard of a timing difference. But that was the only non-compliance issue that we found in the um, financial statements. Uh, if you, the best thing to read in the financial statement is the management discussion and analysis. I know it's a very long document. Um, it's an unaudited part of the financial statements, but it has two years worth of information. It also explains why things have increased or why things have decreased. So it's a pretty good snapshot overview of the city's financial um, and as well as the 12th Development Commission. So the management discussion analysis is one area that I'd look at. The statistical section in the very back is also a great place to look because it has 10 years worth of historical data. So if you're looking to see if things have changed where you were 10 years ago, it's a great place to look. It has information about property taxes, it has information about um, largest employers, things like that. Uh, so it's a great place to look if you have any questions on that. But overall, it was a great audit and it's a clean opinion. So I'm always happy to report on those things. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes. What defines the difference between government and business type activities? So business type activities are um, what we would call proprietary is the other word that can be used for business type activities. Business type activities are um, supposed to be self-sustaining. So for example, you charge the public for some sort of service and they're supposed to essentially cover those charges for those services. So a great thing to example is like water and sewer. So the public is paying for those services and they're supposed to pay for that piece of it. Whereas governmental is usually subsidized by um, property taxes or grants or other sources of revenue. Um, and it's not usually um, that self-balancing piece of it. And we will have a test on these numbers next, next meeting. Uh, it, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. can you guys test Don? Uh, well, that's what I call Matt back up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason Matt's still here. If you have any questions, please uh, direct them to Matt. Uh, we know this is exciting reading. I know you'll probably have it on your nightstand in case you have problems sleeping at night. Uh, but if you don't want to have your hard copy, we'd be more than happy to take them back and, and reuse them that way. But you're more than welcome to take them with you, look through them, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. I also provided all of you one of my business cards. Mm -hmm. um, as you guys can see, hopefully, um, we also are a business that um, is in Tualatin now. So um, we were in the process of moving, I believe, last year when we came out and presented. And so we've been happy to be residents yep. of the city for over a year now. So we're happy to have them. Mm -hmm. They like it too because they're audit. Then they don't have to go down the street <laughs> to do the audit. And this way we can just pop up whenever we want. Yep. That's why we have locking doors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Questions? Oh, can I ask a question? Yes, you may. So actually, I don't want to. Well, one one quick question that just came up, and that is, is that a requirement now that the auditor be a business in Tualatin, or is that something new? Or 
it, it almost should be, but should yet we be, also okay. want to make sure we have the right no, business the doing our audit. Yeah, the only, the only comment I want to make, and it's, it's just, again, my, my own personal uh, opinion and knowing finance the way that I know it is, thank, thank you, Don, thank you for, for what you do um, with respect to all of our numbers. We read about the other problems that cities have um, with respect to a lot of different issues. The city historically has not had those, and it's a, it's a combination, I believe, of a council that actually does read these and pays attention, as you know, from the questions you get at the Budget Committee, Don, and also just the work that you do in association with the auditors and best practices and, and your staff, and, and I thank you for that, and it just makes you know my job a whole lot easier as, as I, I'm not going to speak for the rest of the council, but clearly it's making the council's job a lot easier as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Onward and upward, huh? And I told Tanya she could either sneak away from the table <laughs> or she's more than welcome to sit up here. And I'll sit up here and put pressure on yeah, him. <laughs> answer any questions that they may have. Uh, so the 18 or the 1920 budget to actual. Uh, this slide that I have in front of you right now, I've combined these four funds and the expenditure. You'll see how we're running high and all those compared to last year. There's two real reasons why that is, why that is happening, and they're both related to one-time items. Uh, the transfer for the Twalton City Services building that we had budgeted, though that happened already, so that's one reason why the expenditures are higher, as well as the PERS Employer Incentive Fund that we took advantage of. Those dollars also were already it's paid out so that's why those in all these funds general building sewer operating and storm drain operating it's all uh, related to those two items the general fund revenues you see those are are down a little bit uh, this is a timing issue on a number of our revenues that sometimes a lot of times will come in in December that didn't come in until January so they'll, they'll catch back up in the next quarterly report things like our property taxes uh, we had some franchise fees that came in uh, uh, just after the quarter ended, as well as some court fine revenue. Additionally, we uh, deploy a officer to the TriMet uh, force. We had a number of months there that we did not have someone over there, so we weren't getting that reimbursement back during this time frame as well. On the road utility fee fund, you'll see that number is higher, and that's based upon the amount of pavement maintenance. Uh, work we're doing this year and the timing of that as well. So we had a larger payment maintenance program happening in this fiscal year compared to last. On the road operating fund, you'll see that the revenues are, are running high and our expenditures are running low, which is always a good, uh, good problem to have. Two pieces on the, on the revenues that have come in that are uh, one-offs as well. We got money from Clackamas County for the Borland Road transfer to us. That $366,000 came in, as well as $140,000 for the CDBG grant up on the Sagert Sidewalk Project. Those are both in that revenue category. On the expenditure side, you see the, the drop of, in the percentage of that. That's related to in 18-19, uh, we had a lot of the expenditures for the Lee Ogden Bridge that were happening. Of course, that was a <coughs> capital item that's not happening this year. The water operating fund, you'll see the revenues are down a little bit, uh, and good news is the expenditures are down a little bit too. On the water side, we are actually seeing lower consumption <coughs> in the first six months this year than we did last year. I asked uh, Nick Westendorf about that, and he said, yeah, they were seeing a trend downward, so obviously people are buying less water, our revenues will be down a little bit. Uh, on the expenditure side, again, it's a capital-related item. The C1 Reservoir project was in 1819 and therefore not happening in 1920. Those are the, uh, the areas that I identified that had some variances that I thought needed some explanation. Moving on then to the quarterly uh, quarter end investment report. So our investment policy requires that we present this quarterly to you attached to your staff report. I included the whole, I think it was a 36 page investment reports so you have the whole uh, document there are a lot of other reports i could have but those are the ones that were required to to send to you things like the earnings yield the holdings report transactions the weighted average maturity and then the compliance report uh, our investment advisor does shows that report to show that we're compliant with our policy uh, we do have three funds that we have uh, it's set a separate separate out in three ways our core investment fund which is our general fund monies and all the other funds we have our 
bond proceeds, which uh, because we didn't have enough money in the pool or room in the pool, it's one reason why we went outside. And then the liquidity fund, that's mostly our state pool. A lot of numbers, a lot of real small numbers. I won't ask you to, uh, to read all those. A couple of the fine points that I wanted to put out here, we have about oh, just under $83 million invested across uh, all those funds. 47 million or 57% is in the state local government investment pool. It used to be 100% until we, uh, a little over a year ago, created some policy and hired our investment advisor and started diversifying our portfolio. There are 33.2 million or 40% of our investment portfolio is in US backed securities, agencies and treasury notes in particular. We are earning 2.15% uh, uh, on, our, on our money. The state pool is at 2.25. So we are trending a little lower on this, but that's because we are going out further. And with the rates that have dropped, we uh, extended out our maturities out towards the two to three year range in a number of places, especially with the bond proceeds, we are matching our investments up to when we anticipate those cash flow needs would be. So we're investing the money out to, the, to that. By going out a little bit further also, we are seeing the rates drop a little bit. So we're anticipating that by going out a little bit further, we're locking in some rates that we think uh, the pool and all that will be lower than that out in the future. We have earned about $190,000 in interest in the bond proceeds fund uh, this uh, the first six months. So we are investing and getting more money for that program. Uh, then I also showed you, this is just kind of the breakout of the two, the operating fund, which says our, all our general funds and the water sewer and all those idle funds and then the bond proceeds. And you'll see that there's very little in the state pool in the, uh, the bond proceeds fund. We need the liquidity for things that do happen. So we do have some liquid funds, but the rest are out in investments. Lastly, the, we have kicked off the fiscal year 2021 budget process. It just seems like I just put the 1920 budget to bed and it just seems like we are just in front of you adopting that seemed like last week. I have kicked it off with the departments in January. We gave them general uh, guidelines, again, to continue doing the services that they provide now, the wonderful service they do, and put together the budgets they need to, to uh, continue those services. I've given them to basically this weekend to put all their proposed or their requests into Questica, which is our budget software. At that point, then, I'll start crunching the numbers. We. Uh, City manager and I will sit down with the departments the week of March 16th. This is a great opportunity for her and I and some other staff to sit down and talk through uh, their budgets and what, they're, what they do. And it gives me the opportunity then when I present in front of you, that's the background knowledge that I have is from sitting down and talking with them. It is a very valuable week. Uh, I, had, I met Chair Harrington at a countywide budget presentation thing and she was asking what uh, was my best, my favorite part of our budget process, and I pointed out that this week it is a great opportunity for Sherilyn and I to sit down and and really have some great discussions and find out all the wonderful things our departments are doing. It's a very valuable week, and I, I look forward to it every year. Our first budget committee meeting will be we're going to hijack your work session again on on the first meeting in May, May 11th, so 5 to 7 p.m. and then we'll come back for the second budget committee meeting. Uh, it, it'll be that Wednesday after Memorial Day. I uh, had to go back to that schedule. We changed it up a little bit last year, but I've got a conflict and some scheduling, so I had to go back to this to accompany that. And uh, so we'll have those two meetings. Hopefully we'll, we'll be done in those two meetings. We, though we do have set aside that Thursday night, the 28th, uh, for a third committee if necessary. And then the second meeting in June, which is the 22nd this year, I'll be in front of you asking you to adopt our budget. With that, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, Valerie. I have to get it, dig in the details here, but um, I'm just wondering on the um, portfolio holdings and the operating fund, it's only like probably just over half a percent of the total holdings, but you've got about a half million dollars in this corporate make hole and it's just all in Apple stock. Is there some reason it didn't just go into some index fund or something? It's based upon what's available to us at the time. And they do go out and do bids on, they get three quotes on what's our best uh, options out there at the time. 
and they look at the treasuries, they look at corporates, yeah. and so they look at what the time frame we need uh, and what our, our best options are. Other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. I'm making things go away. All right, so next item on the list is item number two, Southwest Corridor Project Conceptual Design Report, CDR, presented by TriMet and Gary. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and TriMet. Right. Excellent. Um, Thank you. I'm just here to introduce three wonderful individuals who I get to spend a good amount of time with. Uh, here's uh, Amparo Augusto. She's passing out the conceptual design report. Um, and just a real thank you to Amparo. She's been to our CIO meetings, to multiple of our different schools, uh, Latina parents groups, um, uh, aging task force, really trying to get out the word and to meet with all the different uh, neighborhood groups or so out there. Uh, and then to my right is Fiona Cundy, who is the uh, uh, urban design lead on the project, and then Leah Robbins, who is the project manager. So they're going to take you through the uh, conceptual design report here today. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Um, I will um, start off, and I'm glad that you all have um, the hard copy and want to um, thank Fiona because she's led um, the team to, to really pull this together from um, something that is very difficult to look at if it's just looking at plans and being able to translate this project into something that the whole community can um, really understand. So we know that the region is continuing to grow. Um, we continue to expect over 400,000 people here over the next 20 years and with those people um, comes more congestion. They also um, are here for over 260,000 jobs, we anticipate. Um, the Southwest Corridor project is, while it's an expansion of the transit system, it's a major tool um, to, be, to, to benefit the region um, as it continues to grow. Um, it's an 11 mile extension and it will tie into the uh, operating line, the green line, uh, but it will open up um, transit connections to uh, folks coming to this community as well as folks who are uh, living in this community and traveling to jobs around the region. Um, thanks. So uh, quick stats, 13 stations on the uh, extension, a 30 minute trip from Bridgeport Transit Center into Portland. Uh, and based on our current projections and data in our model, um, we are looking at 37,500 trips per day in our model year 2035. We always, um, we're, we're looking at the core of what the project is. That core is much more than just transit and those stations. Um, we are building new infrastructure all through Portland, Tigard, and into Tualatin, and that's in including sidewalks, continuous sidewalks, um, miles and miles of improved regional bike facilities, um, and importantly, over um, uh, 1.6 miles of a shared transit way, and that uh, leverages more uh, transit usage using the separate light rail right-of-way to also benefit um, the high capacity buses uh, that are coming in from Capitol Highway. So we're leveraging that transit asset to um, make a quicker, more reliable trip for more um, riders. And over 2,000 um, park and ride spaces in the corridor. We have made, uh, as part of a, a large partnership, we, uh, TriMet, the City of Portland, Washington County, uh, the City of Tigard, Metro are all partners in a, uh, uh, the Southwest Equitable Development Strategy and a, an MOU to um, ensure that, that there is new housing al alternatives within the corridor up to 950 units of affordable housing. Um, and in building this project, we are leveraging 
over uh, $1.3 billion of federal uh, transit, uh, federal transit administration uh, capital grant funds that are competitive grants across the country. And with that project, we are looking at over 20,000 jobs in building the, the project alone. So the project is still early in early design. We're in the project development phase. We'll be completing that um, in the next calendar year. We're also completing the um, uh, final environmental impact statement this summer. That's an important step which um, um, determines mitigations necessary. And then coming up later this year is a major, the major regional funding strategy and that um, with that uh, funding allocated to the project that allows us to ask the Federal Transit Administration for the next step uh, to enter engineering. And uh, we hope to begin the early phases of construction, earliest um, in calendar 21. So uh, this will be our transition. So we've been out on the road um, in the corridor talking to uh, so many community groups and advisory committees and we're here tonight um, continuing that. And uh, we anticipate, we have a couple open houses um, still left, um, one tomorrow night at Portland State University. And uh, we continue this through, uh, through March 10th. I believe. Yep. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you, Leah. Um, so this is just a short list of some of the the places that we've gone. Um, in addition to those open houses that we open houses that we are hosting, um, and we're getting a, a great variety of comments on um, different topics. So uh, the whole conceptual design report that you have in front of you is pretty much aligned on these four shared values um, that we feel can help shape not only the project but also the region. So everything in the conceptual design report is really focused around these values. Um, one of the things that we took into consideration when we started planning for this project is really thinking about the communities that we're touching and trying to be really thoughtful about how we're you know, stitching them together, thinking about the open spaces and all the, the parks and the communities and the um, schools. Um, and so really, uh, there's a pretty broad stroke of all of the different assets that we um, are trying to tie together in the corridor. Um, and there's also, we hope, a lot of good information about just the general project um, in terms of ridership and how people get to their station. Um, so these stats are put together with the help of um, Metro. And so they really help emphasize the importance of all those different connections that we're trying to make at station areas. Um, as you can see on the, the pie on the right, um, about 65% of people are expected to get to their station on foot. Um, so the 10 miles of sidewalks that we're trying to build um, actually becomes a really critical asset around station areas. Um, we, in, Thinking about the pedestrian connections and how we tie together streets and bike lanes, um, generally we look at about a half a mile walk shed for um, pedestrians and about a three mile walk shed for uh, bicyclists and really are trying to think about not just bikers and walkers but also thinking about station access from a transit perspective. Um, one of the things we've heard in the open houses so far is just how valuable the bus connection really is to people. Um, and so it's, it's hard to show this graphic because it is a future, you know, these changes wouldn't happen until 2027. Um, this is something people care deeply about and um, these are just, they're modeling um, lines on paper right now, but closer to the project opening, we'll be going through a more extensive um, process to reconfigure and enhance those connections. Um, this chart here shows the predicted um, park and rides that we hope to build with the project. Um, as Leah mentioned, we have about 2,000, up to 2,020 park and, space, park and ride spaces right now. Um, as you can see, a lot of them are clustered on the, the southern part of the alignment. Um, and the largest one would be 960 spaces 
um, up to 960 at Bridgeport Transit Center. Um, so we do have lots of graphics in the actual report itself, but this one just really shows how there's all these different elements that go into station area planning and the alignment itself. Um, and so each one of these has um, you know, a chapter, and we hope that people have lots of questions as they um, poke through a lot of these images and graphics. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick overview of the, the southern part of the alignment from um, 60th Station South. Um, so we go, the image on the left shows just that um, transition from the city of Portland um, over I-5 and then dipping under 99W and then popping out at 68th Station. We then head down into the Tiger Triangle, Station Elmhurst, um, dip over to downtown Tigard with a hall station, um, move south to Bonita, Upper Boone's Ferry, and Bridgeport Transit Center. Um, so these are the sorts of graphics that are in the <coughs> report, um, really showing that alignment and why the alignment is there and sort of the associated elements with each station. Um, looking at Bonita Road Station a little closer, you can see that that dash line actually comes up and over the existing heavy rail tracks. Um, we are also avoiding Ball Creek um, and some significant um, property impacts here, which is why we are elevated at this station. Um, this station itself serves neighborhoods to the west and employment to the east um, and has great access to the Fano Creek Regional Trail System. Um, looking a little closer at Upper Boone's Ferry Station, um, this has a split platform configuration. We anticipate gates at both 72nd and Upper Boone's Ferry Crossing. Um, there's also um, the heavy rail tracks there today. Um, and we are looking very closely at what those pedestrian crossings at those two intersections would look like. Um, and then moving south to Bridgeport Transit Center, um, this shows how the station itself is on two parcels on the north. We have the alignment coming in. Um, and on the south, we have the park and ride uh, transit center with buses on the bottom and parking on the top and a pedestrian bridge to connect those two features. Um, because we know Upper Lower Boone's Ferry is a, a highly trafficked road. So getting pedestrians across that. Um, and you also see uh, highlighted in blue up on the left, we've heard from Garrett very strongly that um, improvements to the 72nd Ave crossing are also very important to um, that connection to Bridgeport Village. Um, so this is just a quick rendering of the Bridgeport Transit Center station. You can see the park and ride and that pedestrian bridge um, in the background. And um, we have a lot of, lot of fun design to come. Um, I think, if anything, our message now to the community is that um, this stuff isn't all thought out yet. You know, this is just preliminary design. We're putting it out here really early because we really want your feedback. Um, and we do have so many things down the road to think about in terms of architectural finishes and site furnishings and um, really how we can make these stations an enhancement to the communities that they are serving. Um, so just quickly, we have had two open houses already. Um, we have one tomorrow night in Portland, and we are coming back here on Monday uh, to the Tualatin Elementary School um, for an open house. And we have a Spanish open house as well um, on March 14th. And we're also excited because this stuff isn't just um, for those who can make it, it's also all posted online. Um, so we're trying to get, get the word out. Um, so we'd appreciate any, any feedback that we can get. And that's, that? all right. we'll yeah. open to comments. Feedback? Questions, comments, all right. <laughs> I have two different things. Um, first, um, I'm kind of familiar with downtown, so you've got it like ending at Gibbs. So what does a person do if they work in Portland or Northwest Portland? Right, so Access the, whole the, rest of the downtown. operation of it will be a continuous travel. So starting, if you start at Bridgeport Transit Center, um, the 
that train will travel all the way through downtown on the transit mall and then go over the steel bridge and be, become a green line train that goes out um, one more. It goes right, out, go. out towards Clackamas. But what Clackamas if you're going turn. to downtown, I guess? Right, so going downtown, um, you and I don't... I think the green button. The green button. Something. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the uh, you would travel, Gibbs is around here. Right. Um, you would travel along the transit mall on those 5th and 6th Avenue. Oh, it would Avenue. go to Pioneer Square. Yes. Then. Yeah. Okay, got it. And then my other question is, and I don't know if this is rumor, what I've heard that there's a potential that the bus 96 line would be cut back somewhat and that's the main from Wilsonville like from where I live that's the way we'd get to this right. max line so is is that just a hearsay thing or or that's something I guess I'd want to advocate that, right. that does not happen right and <laughs> and one of the things um, one of the things that we look at is redistributing the service that currently exists out here to um, both extend lines that would continue to be feeders to the, um, the first station at Bridgeport, um, but also some lines that currently travel parallel to the route might pivot and become feeder routes to stations. So that's part of what Fiona was describing about, uh, we don't know what that service plan looks like today. Um, there would be a much more detailed planning effort for that about 18 months before operations. But th those yeah. those advocacy um, points are the things we need to hear too. Okay, then my, my, my last one is um, just, were you saying, um, there was a slide but it's not in our stuff, um, that 65% of people will either walk or bike. So that leaves about 35% that will ride cars, but when I add up the 2,000 spaces for 37,500 riders, that 35% of the people will be driving. So where will these people potentially park <laughs> if you only have parking for 5% of them? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so. So the, the auto actually includes pickup drop-off activity as right. well in okay. the model. So it's not just park and ride. It's like someone who they're spouse is dropping them off at the station in the morning. I think they get included okay. in that 12%. Thank you. Good question. Paul? Yeah, that's great. I'll, I'll go first because I know I'm sure Councillor Kellogg has some questions. So I have several. Um, uh, the first, um, the, the very first one is um, I've heard several comments I, I, and they're not they're not necessarily true comments, but they're comments that I cannot, um, I can't help you convey your, what you're trying to do. One of them is that the Speaker of the House um, is not in favor of any funding because of the disruption you did and gentrification along, I believe it was the green route of the housing. Uh, apparently, and in a conversation with one of her staff members, totally unaware that Tigard and Portland have already started a commission and are working on acquiring lands to exactly affect that. So that's my, my one question. And this 950 pledged housing, that's the first time I've seen that number. I'm happy to see that number. Um, but I would just say there needs to be a lot more education on that, a lot more conversation with the Speaker's office because I know you're asking, f at, at least at, at the last meeting I attended to, which was a couple of months ago, um, you have in your budget 150 million. In my mind, unless Salem comes up with 500 million, this is not going to work. <laughs> and there's no reason for them not to come up with 500 million other than their own whatever issues they have. Um, the other issue is with the Village Inn. We're back to the Village Inn. Mm -hmm. And here's my concern. I happen to be working with them because they have, been, uh, have historically been a very gracious sponsor to Twalden High School's baseball team. I have a kid who plays baseball at Twalden High School. And it's just pure like I didn't. I'm not working with them because I said, "Oh, I know Ryan." It's I'm working with them because literally is as they were drawing straws for parents to go and approach and take care of different contributions. It was, "Can you go to Village Inn?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah." By the way, I know them. Right now, I don't think he'd put a vote yes sign in his restaurant, and I'm concerned about that because I believe that you and the community, the community made it really clear what we want. And I believe you, in reference to TriMet, have gone out of your way to create something that will really work. 
but there's still a lack of communication. Um, for example, I was aware of the 960 parking spaces for a while now, and I had a hard time convincing both Ryan and his mother that that's a true statement because they're concerned with their parking space being overrun because they're still on the 550, which is like two iterations ago. Again, it's a communication yeah, issue, right. but it's, it's an important, I think it's, it's extremely important to, um, to be aware of that and, and to push that narrative so that, because I'm a big fan of rail. <laughs> I would love to see this go in. The next question, the question I have is actually a follow-up to what um, was asked earlier. So if you're taking a feeder route, how does the fare system work? And maybe this is a little bit too technical for right now, but how does the fare system work? Is a f if you have a ticket for a feeder bus, does that automatically give you a f ticket to wherever you're going in downtown Portland? Let's say if you are starting, let's say along Boone's Ferry Road in front of our new housing that we're building over by Horizon High School where the 96 stops and they have a job in downtown Portland. How, how does that, is that one, they would have, I get they would now make a change, they'd right. get off under what's being proposed, but. Right, well we've now moved to the Hop, Hop Fast Pass, which is mobile app based, um, no longer ticket, paper ticketing. Okay. Um, and so a trip is a trip, um, and we, we tap, uh, riders tap whether they're on a bus or a rail, um, and then those those rides accrue, and once you've reached a specific number, um, it's a monthly pass. Level. Okay, and then I'm aware of the discount for um, right. that's available right. to the. So two two more um, quick things. Number one, I noticed on there that you have had um, meetings with the Tigard uh, YAC Youth Advisory Committee. I would strongly encourage you to reach out to the Twalton. Um, and the, and the reason for that is I, I get Tigard has, it, it's a bigger presence in Tigard, I understand all that. But both schools are the same size. Um, both <laughs> schools are part of the same district. But more importantly, um, the Oregon um, Healthy Students data just came out, and, and I'm not gonna get into that, other than it was really, really clear that kids are aware of what their parents are saying, and parents are aware of what their kids are saying. And so to the extent that you can reach out to the Youth Advisory Council and get them understanding and communicating and talking to the parents. And this is all about the vote. I, I mean, this is, I'm sorry, this is all about the vote because mm -hmm. that's all that matters at this point in time. Um, so I would strongly advise you to reach out to them. And then finally, and I've mentioned this um, to Tom Mills among others, and I wanna mention it to you to carry back in your notes. Um, what, what Doug, your general manager, and he's not new anymore, but I still call <laughs> him new, um, has done to me is absolutely phenomenal in terms of communication, talking to the community, um, when I first got involved, before he came on board, the answer was always, we don't have any money. We want a route to Sherwood, we don't have any money. We would like a route out to Oregon City, we don't have any money. And now, all I ever hear from Doug is, you know what, we're really trying to figure out how to do it. I get it's about the money, but it's a whole different attitude. And I think that your attitude about, um, we're trying to figure out how to do it, was crystal clear when it became apparent that there was an issue with the Village Inn and the way you studied all the different routes and the way you listened to the people, particularly the rock climbers who turned out, um, um, and there was Circuit, another company yeah. down there that had just moved down there with a lot of employees, and, and the way that your um, organization addressed those concerns was actually was, was exciting to see because for so long we didn't see that kind of feedback from you people. And so just again, my, my hat's off to Doug and what he has done, uh, all the way down to the bottom of the organization. I get there are other issues. I know there are some people who are saying, I, I've got this problem, but there are problems, but we're now where at least you guys are listening a lot better, and, and uh, we have a long ways to go, but I, I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Robert? Hi, Leah. Hi. Good to see you again. Yes. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanna specifically thank you for increasing the parking lot size at Bridgeport, as we talked about, there's gonna be a lot of demand on that, not just locally, but regionally, um, as the end of the line where people find a place uh, to park and get on that train as soon as they can so they don't have to sit in traffic. So uh, really appreciate that. Uh, the pedestrian improvements uh, at 72nd, those are, as you said, a material aspect. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of traffic going across 72nd there, so I wanna thank you and Garrett for advocating for that. Um, one question I did have, and I know I've 
asked you about this before, so here we go again. Okay. Uh, I look at the Bonita Road Station and the Upper Boone Stations, and I see the West Tracks going right by, but I don't see any line on there that says, says hey, you can station. transfer over right now. Right. What's the status on that? Um, I would say the status is the same, that uh, we see the, um, tigered sta the existing Tigard Station as a transfer. Um, a new station on West um, right now is not contemplated as part of the Southwest Corridor project. Um, so that's, I mean, and, and we aren't actively um, moving in that direction. Okay. Well, I just want to reiterate my concerns from before that, you know, the, the Hall Street station is, looks like about three and a half blocks uh, in terms of the transfer. Uh, which doesn't make it particularly attractive. I mean, three and a half blocks isn't that far, but if I could get a half a block, that'd be certainly a lot better. Right. And the reason I'm so interested in having more, you know, interchangeability between those two trains is that, you know, a lot of people from Tualatin are going to want to ride this train. And instead of having them drive to Bridgeport Transit Center to get a parking spot, right. They could go to the Hagen's lot now where there's a park and ride that always has open spaces. Right. They could get on West and then access uh, the MAX train a lot easier than going all the way up to Hall and, and, and walking back three blocks. Right. So, and I realize we have finite resources, um, but this is our sandbox as we know it today. And so right. I just want to, again, reiterate uh, those considerations. Appreciate so, it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Comments? Uh, my only two comments, and I know Robert has beat and Garrett beat you up about at Upper Boone's Ferry, that if the honey pot has some money left in it to elevate that crossing, because that grade is not going to work. We know it's not going to work. It didn't work 185th. It's not going to work here. Probably no limited funds. But if we can make it work, I think the interchange in that station would be much, uh, much more efficient traffic-wise if it was above the crossing there because it's going to cause bottlenecks. And then on the Bridgeport station, I always beat up on Garrett and we beat up on TriMet. Again, those improvements on the 72nd, uh, we've always talked about the prior city council wanted another pedestrian bridge on that side. Rather than rather having doing improvements at, on grade to have another pedestrian bridge that crossed the 72nd to get people off that street, that would be my ideal. Um, at one point, there were two bridges, but one of them came off again because of cost. Uh, a design way back when uh, that had that cross as people would not cross, you know, to McCormick and Schmitz and back on that street, they would go on an elevated crossing, which again, I would love to see if we have the budget. I think you can see it's going to be a lot less people getting hit, get less people getting stuck in the intersection, and traffic will flow better when you don't have to worry about pedestrians shooting across the street on you. Okay. Can I follow up on that, Mayor? Sure. So to follow up on him, because that, that's another, that intersection, we can't, we've talked to a lot of different people. That intersection is a mess, especially going um, southbound on, or to 72nd, as you turn left onto to Lower Boone's Ferry Road. So it is almost impossible to get through that on a single light at 5 o'clock in the evening. This is going to extend that traffic mess without a without a crossway you're going to end up extending that traffic mess probably get in it all day because right now there's very little foot traffic at that traffic light but if it started becoming heavy use mm -hmm. it would create monumental problems on top of what is already almost an unworkable intersection i understand it's not even in the top 10 in metro because i asked once and some place in milwaukee is number one who knew um, but it is, to us, it's number one. It's a huge problem. And so I would just, you know, to the mayor's okay. comments, that would, that would really be, a, you know, a, a, an awesome thing if you could get that done. So you only have two miracles. Right. Yeah. Uh, three. Yeah. Wait, two. Just two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and also, it, with, 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 uh, and she's no longer here, but she's here in spirit all the time. We do not want um, Councilor Davis to, you know, have to die which was her comment that oh, she would sure. die before there was an at grade crossing. <laughs> she actually said that up here once. She was okay. uh, very yeah. emotional, and we, we like to respect that right. Yeah. <laughs> because the, the concern Paul just mentioned, that left-hand turn from 72nd on to Boone's Ferry, people blast through that light in order to avoid the camera. And I don't want someone stuck in that interchange walking. And the person, 
the motorist has even seen the pedestrian. They're just trying to beat the light, make sure they don't get a ticket at the camera. Mm -hmm. So the bridge is worth it to me. <coughs> Anything else? All right. Thanks for coming out tonight. All right, thank Much you for having it. us. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. I gotta scroll back up. All right. So. General business. All right, general business. Uh, item number one on general business is consideration and recommendations from the council committee on advisory appointments. So that'd be Valerie and Maria. Um, <laughs> we um, we had some people. We had one person for the budget committee that was a reappointment, mm -hmm. Brittany Valley. Yep. yep. Okay, I'm trying to get to my page here. And then we had T. Thank you. We had <laughs> T. Park. We had two reappointments, um, which was Beth Dittman, who is currently the chair, mm -hmm. and then Brandon Gill, who replaced me. And then um, we also had two new appointments, um, Ann Witte and Nadia Alvarado. And I just want to say a little bit about Nadia because um, the whole time I was on T. Park, I always wanted a student on T. Park. I thought. They're the people that'll actually get to use the things we're dreaming of. And so we got a student and she's been on a lot of committees and done a lot of activities in her high school. And um, she speaks Spanish also. And she was so enthusiastic. I mean, I'm pleased with everybody, but I'm especially pleased with her. So one of the things that we asked her is that why would you want to join this committee and what can you bring to this committee? And, and her response was, well, I want to bring a new voice of a teenager. Why we use the parks? Why, what do we want to see in parks? And I really thought that was a pretty darn good <laughs> answer because um, typically we think of kids and, um, and we think of adults and, you know, walking or walking their dogs or, you know, having, having like the little, you know, maybe preteens and under go to the park, but we never think about the teenagers of what they want to see, high schoolers, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds, and I thought that would be, a, she'll bring a whole new perspective of what they're, what they really want to see in parks, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I typically see a lot of, like I say, kids and parents, but I don't see a lot of teenagers use our parks, so I wonder what they're looking for, so. Okay. And um, what was the Ann? Ann? Was it Ann Witty or? Oh, no, we got the other Ann. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she lives on that side of town. On, um, and she is more into beautifications, which I thought was awesome. So we'll see a lot of good voices out there. Mm -hmm. So you're going to make a motion to approve it? <laughs> Who does that? Do we do it? I, I motion that we approve the appointments to the advisory committees. So I, I second that. <laughs> I, I have a motion and a second to approve the recommendations from the council committee on advisory appointments. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, items removed from consent. We have one item the liquor permits by Councillor Morrison. So I have a couple of questions that I hope fully staff that's not here <laughs> can answer. First off, what last year we had approximately 83 liquor licenses from restaurants. This year there's only 50 applications in this form. Last year there were originally there was 70 something, and then within the next four weeks there were an additional 11 that followed up. So this is an unusually low amount. So my question is: Is there do we know why? And my other question is, is there any kind of fine system in place when they, when they come in late? Am I, am I, is this an off, should we just have this sometime later this week? <laughs> Okay, uh, that was my, on this one, I, I know we had a discussion two weeks ago, but this time it was more of a discussion of where are they all. So that's all. That was my okay. one. Thank you. Thank that's you. all. Okay, 
so we need to approve that item though. So is there a motion to approve, what is it? The liquor license renewal for 2020. Uh, renewal for 2020. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the liquor license renewals for 2020. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No one, it's unanimous. Aye. All right, now council communications that we didn't get done in our work session, and we'll start with uh, Robert. I have two items. First, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Councillor Pratt in drafting a letter in support of the upcoming library levy uh, that's been passed around to all you folks. I've given you a date to get comments back to me, uh, and then we've got some folks out in the community who are going to sign on to that letter, but they can't do that until we have a final version. So. If you could uh, turn your attention to that briefly this week, then I would appreciate that. Uh, item two is just to repeat that the uh, TriMet's going to be having an open house on the conceptual design report. Uh, that's on the 2nd from 6 to 8 p.m. at Twalton Elementary. Uh, I'm sure they will have a lot of graphics and boards up there. So anyone who's interested uh, in what the stations are going to look like and making comments on that, please come down. Thank you. Maria? Um, no, not much other than the... Um the council committee meetings that we had and um, meeting people and appointing them into their committee. So I um, always look forward to that. Um, question on the um, on the letter that you were uh, for the levy. Do you want uh, comments from the to, from the community or to do you want just us to write something about it? I'm sorry. I, I kind of read the the letter a little bit and I didn't. Was, yeah, we're going to start with city council and try to get that okay. group, you know, agreed on the content, and then we'll go out to the, the, the public okay. and see if there's anything there. But we are on a bit of a tight timeline. Okay, thank you. And keeping in mind the word count. <laughs> yeah. The word count's what gets you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's all I. That's all I have. Paul. Yeah, a couple of things. I actually brought a printed copy of your uh, thing. Thank you very much. I'll have one comment. I'll shoot you an email on it. Um, with respect to the ending, a minor, minor little, just to, and it's a suggestion, not a requirement. It's not important. So I have a couple of things. Um, first of all, I know at the last council meeting I, I talked to, uh, I believe I mentioned um, bus on shoulder. Um, I, w I attended the Clackamas County Business Alliance breakfast, and they had several speakers from various bus organizations. In, this was Clackamas County, but they are tying in, and I got a clarification from our staff because. I got confused by some of the stuff they were saying, but they are in the process of working on transportation between the hospital uh, um, here in Twalton and Oregon City, and specifically the VA hospital. I know you'd be happy to hear that, Mayor. Um, they will begin testing. Um, you'll see the buses on the shoulder. They will be uh, a pilot car in front, a pilot car in back um, as they test it um, along the 205. And at the same time, and this was very interesting, Wilsonville is also going to be testing from Wilsonville on I-5 to Bridgeport Village, and they will also are planning on using the shoulder, although I don't know how they're going to use the shoulder through Nyberg. That's beyond me. I figured they'll do that, but just be aware that that's going to be going on um, this, this, uh, this spring and summer. Um, I tend to, oh, uh, I mentioned this earlier with the, the TriMet thing, and this is really interesting. The Oregon student health data came out. This is a survey of 8th graders and 11th graders. Of 11th graders, and there was a lot of questions, and I'm just going to, on the one that just to me was most impressive, the question asked was, would your parents be disappointed if you used, and then there were four categories, prescription drugs without a prescription, marijuana, alcohol, or tobacco. Marijuana scored the lowest, in other words, their parents would be upset, was the lowest amount, slightly below 90 percent, and everything else was above 90 percent. So the kids are clearly hearing from their parents that they're not to be, that they shouldn't be using alcohol, they shouldn't be smoking cigarettes, and, and so that was, that was really nice to hear. It, we're, we have a long ways to go in education, all that other stuff, but just that one number, everybody was kind of happy to see the students acknowledging at least that their parents would be upset if they were using. Uh, the second thing, there's a new Brownie troop. They are in Tualatin. I have recommended be on the, they will be reaching out. Um, I, I gave them your name and number, Sheldon, to start with. Uh, they would love to come sometime, hopefully this summer, and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, it was in the process of buying Girl Scout cookies, of course, because you got to have Girl Scout cookies. Um, 
Uh, second to last, uh, C4 subcommittee, uh, we sent out, and I, I was under the impression everybody was sent the letter, and if you were not sent the letter, um, then let me know. Uh, Charlotte has a copy of it. Um, the Clackamas County voted to send a letter to the legislature on the funding for 205, and our logo was included, and we discussed this at the last um, meeting, um, and the letter was just, is very, just very nicely, please, would you fund the project? And it's in support of Rachel Pusak's amendment um, to a bill that's still alive and in committee, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. It came out of one committee, um, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, it's a very short session, though it ends pretty soon. Um, and then finally, a lot of confusion over the cost of a study for 99W. At Clackamas County, they were talking about Washington County asking for an ask of $10 million to study, which I w made quite clear to Jamie that that was incorrect, um, that I believe that this number was a million dollars. But I also, when I had this discussion with Sherilyn, um, ODOT is now going to make uh, modifications to I-5 through 99W to Main Street. And so the question is, what will those modifications do to what we are asking for? What would our million dollars include? Because I'm assuming the million dollars originally was from Sherwood to I-5. But again, l a lack of specifics. And so I know, Mayor, you have a lot of different conversations at a lot of different meetings. And so to the, number one, to the point you can clarify it's only a million. I've been doing my part with the Clackamas County Group that it's only a million dollars. It is not ten million. It's is it two S? Two, 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 okay. There's two S's. One, there's a million dollar ask from the legislature, and a five million dollar ask from the T2020. So it's five million now for T2020. Okay, so that's even a different number. So a <laughs> lot of a lot of numbers floating around. I think, and, and again, it's my point to TriMed. If we're not really crystal, crystal clear on what the numbers are. It allows that message to get distorted by people who are interested in distorting the message for their own reasons. And so to the extent that if you're assuming you're all in favor of, of light rail, assuming you're all in favor of the T2020 projects, then it's to our benefit to, to clarify and get that message out. That's all I have. Okay. Valerie? Um, I was at the um, 12 Community Police Foundation meeting earlier today, and um, a kind of off subject got brought up that um, I guess there's a lot of a Latino youth in our community, and um, they are strongly desiring to use the soccer fields. A lot of these children cannot, their parents can't afford to put them in the leagues. And um, I just want to bring awareness to that as we get back to that parks mm -hmm. discussion. That's another thing we really need to maybe come up with or put our thinking caps on, I guess, and um, consider that as part of what we want to include in our access to parks going forward. Um, other than that, um, I don't have a lot. I just wanted, um, oh, because we were talking about the library levy. I thought I'd promote a couple library things. So, um, Right now they're doing a food for fine. So if you have a library fine, they'll give you a dollar for every off for every can you bring in, up to $10. And they're um, more than happy to take donations from anybody. And then um, coming up in April is, I know this is one of your favorites, the Vine to Wine for the Lib 12th Library Foundation which is a great, you know, um, evening event where you get to do wine tasting and food and get some nice music. That's it. All right. Uh, let's see. So going back, uh, February 12th, there was a meeting called by the MMC, um, I'm not going to call an emergency meeting, but a pop-up meeting uh, that was held out in Gresham by Mayor Bemis uh, to discuss the... Uh, Progression of the discussions. Remember, I've talked before about GPI merging with the Port Northern Business Alliance. The board uh, has approved to move, look forward and approve maybe looking at changing uh, the contract and um, IGA and how they would work. They're still allowed no <laughs> from the small cities concerned, but we were outvoted. Uh, Mayor Knapp represents the small cities, and he was the only no vote on the board. And it's about 40 people on this board uh, not to proceed with the proposed merger. So we're going to have a meeting uh, this Thursday again with GPI. I guess we'll hear the latest and greatest. Um, the chair of GPI came to the meeting and uh, got peppered with questions from the regional mayors on the distrust of BPA, uh, the PBA, and uh, that the Leopard's going to have to change its spots. If it's going to say it's going to be regional, then that's got to put up and see that because no one's has seen PBA be regional focused versus Port Portland focused. So that continues on. 
Uh, on the 14th, there was the mayor's lunch in Beaverton where the three projects of Washington County that are tier two projects, so Paul just mentioned one, so 99W, 217, and the Sunset Corridor projects. The presenters did a dry run to the mayors before they went to Metro so they could practice and let us uh, beat up on them. Uh, so they did that and uh, we gave them a lot of feedback on what they could do better uh, when they go to Metro. On the 17th, I was the speaker at the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I basically did the same presentation uh, that we're giving about moving 12th and forward. And folks were amazed at what we're doing, the amount of outreach, how well we're managing our funds, and that is to them was a model for the rest of the county and how things should be done, so very well received. Uh, on the 18th, another emergency meeting pop up. Uh, Metro Ch uh, President Lynn Peterson asked the mayors of the region to come in for a briefing on the Home Together initiative. That's the wraparound services uh, that you're hearing all about, but the new taxes, the uh, income tax and now a business tax. Um, Here Together gave a presentation of why they want to do this, the t what they're going to do with the $250 million, how Metro will be involved, and how the counties will be involved. Again, uh, they got peppered by the region's mayors very heavily on um, timing and lack of coordination and um, not really bringing the cities into the loop until the last minute. Um, and I'm going to get back to this again. On the 19th, there was the T2020 meeting where they actually gave the presentations. So the, four watch, the three Washington County presentations that night were 99W, 217 and such a quarter. I went and gave public comment to uh, promote and ask that those three were approved. The fourth one is um, 43 from Clackamas County to improve 43. Based on what I heard the next day, um, the 99W project survived the vetting, but 217 and Sunset Quarter were beat up like crazy by the T2020 committee. So the 99W, they feel fairly confident might proceed as a tier two project for funding. Uh, 43 was very, uh, was received much better than our three projects. Uh, the problem with 217 was uh, diversity, economic diversity, and Sunset Corridor. Um, one of the things that's buried inside the Sunset Corridor project is a tunnel through the hills, through the West Hills, I guess, and that just freaked out people around Forest Park. Um, so I don't think 217 and Sunset Corridor are going to survive as tier two projects for funding. Uh, 99W has a, pre a chance. Uh, on the 20th, Sherlyn, Jonathan, and Quilla and I went to uh, Greater Portland Inc.'s annual summit at the Art Museum. Uh, basically, they were celebrating partnerships, and this year was a focus on uh, business and education, that the educational uh, facilities in the area, everywhere from Clackamas Community College, it's OSU, um, OSU, Clark College, uh, focusing on uh, investment in research, uh, coordination with faculty, so apprenticeships, and um, the lack of funding from tax-wise that the state, both states, Washington, Oregon, have decreased the funding of uh, institutions, educational institutions, and needs to be restored. That again, more and more reliant on tuition funds, and when they do that, they have to re increase you know tuition, and that's not sustainable. Uh, going back to home together, because we had a meeting again today. Uh, Chair Harrington had a meeting to again hit up the regional mayors in Washington County to promote Here Together, Here Together gave it another pro presentation and now they have the numbers where they're looking at a 1% uh, income tax on folks that make uh, 150,000 as a single or 200,000 as a family. And now there's a business tax element that's put into it for businesses and this keeps shifting. I think it's 50 million, 5 million uh, in the area. Um, yeah, gross. This is the gross receipts. Taxes on profit. Yeah. All right. Yeah. They're going to vote tomorrow on to see if it, they can get it up. First, make sure they have all the numbers right, <laughs> which is a problem last time. And then if they can get, you know, I'm assuming it's going to pass because we're getting pressed pretty hard to support it. Uh, the mayor's take is we all see the need for this. And um, our problem is the timing because it could, uh, it threatens the sheriff's levy. It threatens Tiger's public safety levy because the, the folks are going to see another uh, initiative that, again, it's they're selling as high income earners, but you know most people are like, oh, okay, I don't make that kind of money. 
but the business tax part of it might hit. Uh, the PBA came out in favor of this, um, but the question I asked this morning. Just by, for five million? For, for five but million or more. Gross receipt. Gross receipt. Right, you're gonna pay one percent. Yeah, so a company could be, when they show the numbers, say you're uh, a, uh, a couple that makes 230 grand, you'd be taxed on that 30 grand, so you'd be paying about $300 a year. A uh, business that makes five something million, we'd be taxed about seven seven thousand dollars which could be a small business five million five million well they can yeah yeah. Like yeah 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 consider a big business. right right yeah so that's the thing they're um the problem they have is that they don't have all the details yet which is hard for us to get behind it and how they're going to implement this for instance today they said well you know they're going to collect 250 million dollars a year and metro's allowed to set aside five percent for admin uh, then the counties would have their set-asides for administration. And the way they're envisioning right now, that Washington County would get 33 and a third percent of the money, Multnomah County would get 45 and a third, and Clackamas County would get 21 and a third. Uh, and that would be for two years. They did concede at first they were saying that the tax would be for 10 years and Metro would have the authority to uh, renew it, but they have changed that now that it's going to have to go back out to public vote. So tomorrow, I think there's going to be more gyrations before the final vote. So who knows? Are but go ahead. The cap tax for city this year? No. And then what? And, and then am I brought up? What about the taxes in November? Right. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. The C4 subcommittee. This <laughs> this became a conversation because uh, Clackamas County Chair Bernard is on a committee. Mm -hmm. The information he relayed was just stunning. Well, first off, I will say that a Metro Councilor was quoted, I believe it was in the Oregonian, as saying that, yes, I know we don't have all, all the details worked out, but we're just going to ask the voters to trust us. I don't trust Metro, I'm sorry. <laughs> Unless it has to do with the zoo, I'm not. And I would say now with waste management, they've gotten really good at that. Other than that They don't have a very good track record, and I'm sorry. That's just my own personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Here's the other problem. The original tax on the what we call wealthy individuals, they admitted that four years ago it would have only raised $73 million. That right now that income is being driven by profits from the stock market. That's not going to last. And so that was another huge problem. Now they then added in the business. I, I don't know how you can keep hacking businesses and keep them solvent. Again, poorly conceived, rushed. Uh, the Oregonian had an editorial. If you haven't had a chance to read mm -hmm. it, read it. It's really, really good about it just being rushed and too soon and let the housing, they have a housing bond that let that work out. Um, so, but as the mayor says, uh, they are voting yeah, no. on it tomorrow. And the <laughs> comment, the, or, the editorials by both the pamphlet paper and the Oregonian were brought up, and the response was right now they're against it, but once we flush out the details, we're confident they'll support it. They when they get the details, exactly. <laughs> yep. So once they figure out the details, I guess they'll come back out to the mayors and to all of us to present it. Uh, right now, it's just a moving target. Yeah. Um, again, it's uh, we all can see it, it needs to be done. Uh, is this the best plan? Let's see. Um, but can we trust Metro to implement you know correctly? And then. Uh, will the three counties get along when the funding comes, you know, comes across? Um, will they? Because there's there's a two year they're gonna they agreed for those percentages for two years, then they'll reevaluate if certain counties need more money. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Because uh, the question I asked them was, who's going to collect this? They don't know yet. Because yeah, Department of Revenue uh, said <coughs> right now they can't because they're still trying to figure out the Student Success Act how to collect that. And then they said the city of Portland might do it, their revenue division. I said, well, I happen to know since I'm a contractor that the revenue division is going through a major system change and changing over how they're going to collect taxes for the next year. So I know that's going to be on their radar. Um, but I, we're going to hear more because all three county chairs are super behind this, and so is you know Lynn Peterson. So more to come on that. Uh, before I did that, we had Forest Grove and Cornelius had their joint state of the cities this morning. Uh, if, has anyone been at, have you been at the new Cornelius Library? I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, how they did, you know, the libraries on the first floor, you know, affordable housing on the above floors. Um, it's the first time I was able to get out there, and it's a nice setup. And they got a privately run coffee guy who gets rave reviews inside uh, that they plug big time that you should buy coffee as you left the state of the city. <laughs> so nice. 
Um, coming up uh, tomorrow night is the West Lynn State of the City. That should be interesting. <laughs> yes, I am looking forward to that one. <laughs> um, and then another one I'm super looking forward to is on the 26th is lunch with the mayor where I meet some Hazelbrook kids who uh, are in a competition to have lunch with me and present their thoughts and questions. We did it last year. It was a lot of fun, some terrific questions from these kids. So looking forward to that. And then uh, this Thursday is my day of meetings where I have Metro Mayor's Consortium. We're gonna be talking to the legislature, what's going on, how that's shaken out. Now that the Republicans walked out, it'll probably come to a crawl. Uh, Greater Portland Inc. is gonna have their presentation. It's a chamber board meeting. And then that evening, I'm meeting the YIC uh, kids and their parents that are going to Washington, D.C. with us. And that's it. It's going to be busy. That's, bu that's it. Amen. So, yeah, yeah. And so next meeting, I won't be here and Bridget won't be here, right? Correct. Yeah, so Bridget and I will be in D.C. Oh, yeah, I was asked to go by Clackamas County. I said we already had too many people from Clackamas County. And it was it's, the same message. So. That, you know, more than the Last year, they had 80 of us from Oregon. We had, no, we had the biggest contingent. I, I agree, but I just, you and I are going to send the exact same thing. Oh, yeah. Meeting, so yeah, yeah. I just, to your point. Right. And I got confirmed. I have a, ma a meeting with uh, both Senators Wyden and Merkley the Thursday after it ends. Okay. So both see them in the afternoon and head to Reagan <laughs> to get on the plane. There you go. Yep. We'll All right. That. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second. I motion second to adjourn. Any discussion of the motion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Have a good night.